right, so we're going to um, pick up where we left off last time, which is a discussion about segmentation. And we're talking about different types of segmentation, and we're going to continue. We're just going to review a couple of key points. So today we're talking about chapter 9. We're going to talk a little bit about um, chapter 10 and touch a bit about chapter 11, but don't worry, next time we're going to get into um, chapter 10 in more detail and also chapter 11, but I just want you to see the, the big picture of where we're going and how segmentation is so significant, segmentation and positioning, and then how that um, ties to products, and then how the products are related to brands. And one of the important takeaways is that the brand is what's wrapped around the product. That's what this visual here suggests. Because what did we say? That all products in a given category have the same functionality. So for example, cars all provide transportation. What makes one car unique from another is the fact that they're wrapped in different brands. And the brand is what differentiates one product from another and communicates the value. And a brand is a very complex Sorry. entity. Brands have personalities and identities. And importantly, brands can accumulate equity. So we spend a lot of time talking about brand equity. And we're going to certainly um, talk about that in a lot more detail in chapter 11, because for example, the Coca-Cola brand has, it's estimated a value of about $68 billion, which is quite significant, wouldn't you agree? I mean, almost $70 billion? Exactly. If it was like $68 million, then you might think, well, that's a lot too, but $68 billion, I mean, there's many companies that aren't even that big, right? So when I say $68 billion, that's not the assets of the entire company. That's just the value of their brand. That's why that's so compelling and why, like from day one, we started to talk a bit about branding and its importance. So uh, if you look at um, companies that are successful in the marketplace, they've accumulated a portfolio of power brands. But we'll, we'll talk more about that. Let's um, try to continue where we left off uh, regarding segmentation. And I want us to just briefly recap. Who could tell me some of the key criteria for segmenting a market? Remember, we said there's several things that we look at when we, when we segment um, a market, and we said there's also some criteria that we use when we're selecting particular segments. So we're not going to try and penetrate all segments. There's some that are more preferable than others. But first, let's talk about some of the criteria that we use in segmenting a market. Go ahead. Tell me your name. Ben Clayton. Okay, Ben, go ahead. Uh, you want to identify a similar need? Um, so segments in um, segments that we identify, we want them to have the, the the customers to have or the potential customers to have um, similar needs and wants is what Ben is saying. Absolutely. So when we divide a market into sub markets or we aggregate um, potential customers into these groups or segments, certainly what Ben is saying is right on is we want them to have similar needs and wants. And go ahead. Large. Absolutely, large. Now remember I said last time, it doesn't mean that a small segment, which we refer to as a niche, it doesn't mean that um, we can't be successful with um, focusing on a niche, but more often than not, it's important to identify segments that are large. Um, reachable. Reachable, right. 
reachable. And we talked a bit about that, what that means. In other words, that we're able to access them through our marketing communications plan, which is very important. Age. Age. Okay, well, age is um, a type of segmentation, right? That's a type of demographic segmentation. It's not um, one of the requirements. But I, I, I see what you're saying. We could certainly segment the market by age. People will respond in a similar way to what you're marketing. Right, so respond to the marketing mix in a similar way. So we have large, reachable, Ben says similar needs and wants, and responds to the marketing mix in a similar way. Now who could explain that? What does that mean? Responds to the marketing mix in a similar way. What does that actually mean? Go ahead, tell us. That have the same type of behavior when it comes to consuming the product? Like they Yes, that's certainly same, part of it. Could be. They can pay the same prices or they buy online or go to the store. Yeah, so at a certain price, um, a significant percentage well, of those in the target market would um, purchase the product. So price is certainly, when we say marketing mix, price is one of the, the elements and that they're going to respond in a similar way. And also you suggested place, which means that they shop for the product in a similar um, channel of distribution. So last time we talked about the fact that, let's say, um, a particular segment that we've identified, right? We identify it. This is very strategic. This is something that we have to leverage our critical thinking skills to be able to um, determine the segment People in the segment, our potential customers, might all shop online. That's important to us. That's important for us that we've identified a segment that has that type of purchase behavior, as you were suggesting, that they all shop online. Why is that? Like, why do we care? Like, why, are we, why don't we just look at all, like, the entire market, all men? So you say, why not? We, all men, we want to sell our product to all men. Why is that so crazy? Why does it matter that, um, that they all have similar needs and wants or that they um, respond to the marketing mix in a similar way? So yeah. Chances are, from age 18 to 100, you're not going to have the same interests. And Absolutely. Based, based on that, if you market a, a Apple computer to a 98-year-old, he's not going to buy it. How can you market uh, to that? I would nature? think you're uh, you're right. I would, yeah. As much as we we're all fond of Apple um, branded products, yeah, it's unlikely that uh, we're going to close that deal. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no pressure. Okay, uh, take yeah, your mind. I'll say, I'll say, yeah. Oh. Um, so <laughs> I was saying what, what what you said that quote that you, that you said last time in class. Uh, that uh, we only target, we, we know that we're missing out, we only get 49% of the market. Meaning that, like, we, well, who we want to target is the people that we know are going to buy our products. That's why we want to be as specific as possible in order to reach those people specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we know that there might be some waste, but we want to try and still be as efficient as possible. And if we have segments where they have similar needs and wants, um, and they respond to the marketing mix in a similar way, and the segment is um, large and reachable, well, that makes marketing for us um, efficient. Now the thing is that we're still going to have multiple segments, but we're going to have to customize our marketing mix for each of those segments. And the more specific, um, the better. Just like remember I said, if we're selling a product and our target market is 18 to 25 year olds, well you don't want me to be in a commercial because that's not going to be a selling point. Oh yeah, I'm going to buy the product that Coach buys. Like, no, you don't want to buy, you'd like to think, well, you know, the products that the professor used um, are not products that I would use because I'm young and cool and hip and everybody likes me, right? So you want to have uh, people in the commercial, for example, that the target audience can connect with, that they could relate with. Does that make sense? So we're going to identify multiple segments, and then we're going to have to decide which segments we're going to focus on, which is called targeting. So after we segment the market, 
After we divide the market into sub-markets, then what we're going to do is focus on certain segments. Now, why wouldn't we focus on all segments? What would be the what would be the challenge? Yes, go ahead. Absolutely. So certain age groups, um, the product is not relevant, or certain, uh, let's say, certain religions, or certain ethnicities. Absolutely. So really good point. All right. So let's keep moving forward. We talked about geographic segmentation. So that's dividing a market into sub-markets based on yeah, region, for example, country, city. Those are types of geographic segmentation. We have to ask ourselves whether or not that's compelling or insightful enough. Because when we do that, remember, if we say, for example, if we segment the market um, geographically and we say region is one of the segments. Now, certainly North America is a large region in terms of the number of people that live there, in terms of the population, right? Hundreds of millions. And South America, Latin America, um, Europe, et cetera, et cetera. What is the assumption that we're making? We're assuming that what? What's the assumption if we, if we take that approach? That those regions, that the people who live there all have similar needs and wants. Awesome. That, that's, a, that's a pretty big assumption. Now in some cases, maybe that's the case. Most of the time, it's not. So we need to customize our marketing mix. And the same would apply by country, but I think when you get down to the country level, it's, you might feel it's a little bit more reasonable to generalize at the country level. Because take, for example, Asia. What countries comprise Asia? China. So Japan, China, Russia, Korea, Russia, Korea. 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 Central Asian countries. Israel, Asia. Yeah. Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, no, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan. So now, now think about the countries that you just mentioned. Think about the, the cultural differences. Think about the cultural differences that we have here. So we as, um, as marketers, we think of Asia as, like you said, China and Japan. And we think of um, the people who live there as Asians, but you know, China and Japan, they have a, um, a very interesting history that is very unpleasant. So to say that their needs and wants are similar is also a very broad generalization. Korea, also um, a very different um, cultural dynamic. Now it doesn't mean that Asian countries like Japan, Korea, and China don't have some similarities um, in cultural um, ways, but there's also a lot of differences. So as marketers, we need to be sensitive to that. You follow what I'm saying? Right, so in, our, in terms of uh, like this one size fits all, to think that, oh, we're just gonna sell this product um, to all Asian countries, and we don't need to customize it in any way. And these are very different countries, very um, diverse, and different from each other. Like take for example, Japan has established a very significant presence in heavy manufacturing. So for quite a long time, for quite a long time, um, Japan has developed an expertise in manufacturing <coughs> items like cars, for example. Right, that's what we mean by heavy manufacturing. Whereas China, um, tried in the past to become a heavy manufacturer and they failed. They're revisiting that again now. So um, they are um, producing um, some cars, but really they've demonstrated an expertise in what we call light manufacturing, which is generally what we refer to as labor intensive. So a lot of cut and sew operations, 
which means making all sorts of apparel, handbags, things that require stitching, right? Cutting materials and stitching them together, and other labor-intensive processes. So very different countries and all aspects. That's what I'm trying to show you here is that they're different in a lot of ways. And that's why it's, um, a, it's quite a generalization to say that, well, they're um, part of the same segment, part of the same geographic segmentation, that we would just apply the same marketing mix to those three countries, let's say. Not that we're excluding the others, but let's just say we're talking about Korea and Japan and China. So you might want to go down to, from the region to the country level to the city level. Now you're at a level where I think you're more um, in a position to make some generalizations. And you could say, well, people that live in a certain city, whether it's Guangzhou or um, Shanghai or Beijing, yeah, I think it would be more reasonable to draw some assumptions and make some generalizations about um, their lifestyle, um, their needs, and their wants. I think it would be more reasonable to say that there's um, similarities that we could identify. Uh, wouldn't, couldn't someone argue that maybe um, a product which didn't need to be more specialized, more broken down for different segments, a product that is easier to sell to a large uh, geographic setting is maybe a better product sometimes? For example, iPhone. Maybe they market it differently, but it's the same iPhone all around. But even different water companies have to use different styles, different bottle types, different art artsy patterns on their bottles to sell to different regions. Well, that's all part of um, the marketing mix. So if we're changing the product or the packaging or <laughs> the, um, the amount of um, memory that's in the product, so if it's uh, 2 gigabytes versus 4 gigabytes or 6 gigabytes or 8 gigabytes, then we're customizing the product. And if we are, um, for example, selling in a market where the level of disposable income is lower, and we're trying to sell products um, that provide the same functionality, right, that it might be a smartphone. With some markets, we sell smartphones for $600 and some $500. In other markets, maybe $100. But it has less storage capability. Maybe it doesn't have the camera functionality, etc. So once you start to change all those aspects, you change the price, you change the, the, um, the elements of the product, then we're changing um, the, marketing need, the marketing mix to meet the needs of that particular market. So, yeah, I mean, and that's ideal to, that you've done that because more often than not, the needs are not similar based on region. Okay, so, um, even those countries in the same region, they're not going to have similar needs and wants. Even within a particular city, there's some people that are very affluent that they might have, that they could afford to buy um, a model that's 600 and others maybe only $100. Right? But with those are just some examples. In some cases, it's relevant to segment the market geographically and can be very insightful. And in other cases, it's not going to be the key to us successfully marketing our product. Uh, doesn't that also tie into the concept of uh, social responsibility? I would like to think it all ties into social responsibility and um, ethics. But tell, tell me uh, what you're thinking specifically. No, because you're adjusting your product so it can meet the uh, consumer's uh, financial needs. Otherwise, oh, well, yeah, if, yeah, or, yeah I, I see what you're saying. In that case, like if we stick with the smartphone, um, if we believe that wireless communication is an inalienable right, that we feel strongly that everybody needs to have wireless communication or everybody should have internet access or everybody should have, we talked about, access to prescription medication and so forth. Sure, if that's, um, we might position it that way. That would be an interesting um, way to approach um, the market. Uh, it doesn't really sound like social responsibility, it just seems like 
the company wants to make the most money, they, they give that as a product. That doesn't seem like a right. social responsibility. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, a company could sell a product at um, multiple price points, you're right, and it doesn't mean that they're doing something socially responsible, but I think what the way that um, you were suggesting it is that we would present the idea as that being our motivation. Not just that we want to sell um, wireless communication at $100. You're right. You're right. You could have a, a good, better, best pricing strategy, which is very common. And that doesn't mean that you're engaged in social responsibility. But I think what he was suggesting is that couldn't we sort of spin that and say that the reason we're doing that is because we believe that everybody should have access to wireless communication. So I'm saying, are we saying that's a pretty far-fetched spin? <laughs> well, I don't know. It's, right now, it sounds like a... a, a well, um, really wants it to do good that, like, action. Right. Right. Yeah. right, I mean, it's a way yeah, to... Somebody like you know, it's the way that um, we're, we're just sharing, we're, we're just suggesting that that's our motive, and maybe we could get some publicity. If I have that feeling of social responsibility, and I'm owner of the company, I can do that, and market it that way. And, nothing, and you have no marketing, like that, there's nothing. What if I have such a big business, I'm not losing anything? Like, the point is that you can do it. If you yeah, I mean, companies do that now, I and mean, what, what are some of the examples of where companies um, promote their activities as being something that's socially responsible. Like take for example Starbucks and you know um, this idea of um, companies supporting free trade and also um, they have, um, what's their, they have a, um, a, a lot of water and so what they're just selling water but no they really, what are they saying? They say that they believe that everybody in the world should have access to fresh water. Because believe it or not, there's um, quite a few people around the world that don't have access to fresh water. We take it for granted in the United States, you go to the water fountain and so forth, in our, in our house or in our apartment, but that's not the case around the world. But aren't they just, they're just selling bottled water, but they position it as, no, well this is, we're sell the reason we're selling water is because we believe that everybody should have access to fresh water. Isn't that the way that they position it? Or some companies say, if you buy our product, um, you know, every product that we sell, we donate a dollar to a certain cause. But aren't you really just selling laptops? What, is, what does that have to do with every laptop you sell, you donate $10 to breast cancer? So what's the real reason that you're selling laptops? To raise money for breast cancer or to sell laptops, which is what you're saying, right? Like you're selling laptops. What? What are you? Uh, you know? What are you kidding me? What does that have to do? Why is that something socially responsible? Just because you decide you're going to give money to this worthwhile cause, does that mean it's something that's socially responsible? But I don't want to digress too much on there because we need to talk about segmentation. We could talk about that after class. But you you raise an interesting point. We talked about demographic segmentation which we talked about examples of age, we talked about gender, race, ethnicity, income level, occupation, um, level of education. Those are all good examples of demographic segmentation. And the reason why it's so compelling, the reason why we even talk about that as an example, is because in many cases it is insightful that people in a certain age group or in a gender or a certain income level, that they do have similar needs and wants, that they do respond to the marketing mix in a similar way, that these segments are large and reachable. And by the way, it doesn't mean everybody in that segment. Right? Don't get hung up on that. Well, what do you, you know, it doesn't have to be everybody, just that a significant percentage of the segment is going to respond in a similar way to the marketing mix. We talk about psychographics which has to do with lifestyles, interests, hobbies, opinions, attitudes. That's what we mean when we talk about psychographics. And we talked last time, then we talked last time about different life stages. How people in different life stages have similar needs and wants and respond in a similar way to the marketing mix. So for example, if you're single, 
if you're married, if you're married with kids, if um, you're an empty nester. So it's plausible. We have to decide what's going to be most relevant for our particular product or service. But certainly you could see how that's insightful. Right? Is that plausible? We think, well, yeah, people that are married and have kids, they probably do, they have some commonality. That seems plausible, but again, it depends on our product or service. And then where we left off really was we started to talk about behavioral segmentation. And we started to talk about usage rate. So an example of behavioral segmentation is usage rate. So how much of the product do we consume? So for example, are we light users? So do we use the product infrequently? Are we moderate users of the product or heavy users? Why is that insightful? Why do you think that heavy users might have something in common and have similar needs and wants? And the same being true of the other segments. Because what we're doing is we're aggregating potential customers or existing customers into these groups. And we're saying we know that there's customers that don't use our product frequently. Like let's say it's peanut butter. And there's some that while they only buy peanut butter once a month, there's some that buy peanut butter once a week. Those would be the moderate users. And there's some that are heavy users that buy peanut butter not once a week, but three times a week. So how is that insightful to us? Why would, why would we care? Whether it's peanut butter or milk, so somebody buys, they're a light user, they buy one gallon of milk a day, uh, a month. Moderate users, they buy one gallon of milk a week. And heavy users, they buy a gallon of milk every other day. How does that help us? Tell us, what do you, what do you think about that? Because we would spend more of our, our marketing budget on the heavy users as opposed to the light, light users to, to advertise to the heavy users. We, we might do that. Um, that why would we do that, though? I'm, I'm not, we, I, I, I agree. We need to spend money. No, no, I'm not disagreeing with you. I just want to let's talk, talk, this, talk it through. Why? Um, tell us, share with us. I agree, we should spend money um, advertising to heavy users. What is the benefit of doing that? What's the benefit of advertising to the heavy users? So they continue to... Yeah, absolutely. So don't make the mistake. You know, you raise a really good point. Um, you keep a relationship. Yeah, we, we've developed there. Apparently, they are heavy users of the product. We need to sustain that. We need to make sure that they don't have what's called buyer's remorse. So if they're heavy users, we don't want them to experience buyer's remorse or what sometimes is called post-cognitive dissonance, which means that after they buy the product that they're double-guessing themselves. We need to manage that part of the process. So absolutely. We need to reinforce, yes, you made the right decision. You bought milk instead of orange juice, right? So you need to continue to reach out to them and get them, ideally, to through a different, a variety of different um, approaches, certainly <laughs> advertising is one of them, to get them to continue to buy milk. So excellent. So what about the others? So we're going to spend some money to advertise to those that are already heavy users. If I milk all the time? Well, not only advertising the product, I think we can like modify it. Like it's actually for most for all categories, 
like for example peanut butter mixed with jelly or like milk, all kinds of milk, like zero fat, low fat, because for long time users they can get bored or like there can be health whatever like things that may prevent people from using so we make like low fat milk or whatever and for those who are not so to get them to be more heavy we can like do different varieties and like get them more involved in that. Yeah so we could augment the product uh, as you're suggesting um, and also add different features and flavors. we need to yeah absolutely different flavors because the light users the thing about the light users is that we need to understand why is their consumption of milk so low now, see, these are the things when you do research, <clears throat> you need to probe and keep asking and questioning to try and understand the purchase motivation or maybe the lack of purchase motivation. So we need to keep, continue um, to ask the right questions. And I think you raise a good point, Alexi raises a good point, that maybe the reason they're light users of milk is because they perceive milk as being high in fat or cholesterol. So if we come out with another version that we market as um, low fat or more um, healthy, Calcium. then we're going to be able to attract those non-users. So we, you know, the different prospective buying groups, we have users, we have non-users, for example. So you're right, there's some non-users or some light users. We need to address that. We need to find out why it is that they're a light user. The same thing with, with orange juice, the other side of it, is that, well, they say, well, why don't you drink orange juice? Well, because I, my doctor said I really need to get a lot of calcium in my diet. And I need to, you know, vitamin A and D is important to me. So that's going to address that issue. We have to overcome those issues and concerns and those reasons that people aren't buying or using our product. So this is definitely very insightful. And also to your point, we're going to certainly spend money on heavy users because we need to keep them as our customers. But at the same time, they're already heavy users. So like... Well, it's easier to retain the customers that we have than it is to attract new customers. But easier meaning that we have to spend less effort for that. Right, so even more so that we should do that because these people have already used our product and like it. They've already seen our print ads. They've already seen our commercials. So we need to stay top of mind. We just need to reinforce that. So our advertising objective is to build and grow the level of awareness whether it's the brand awareness or continue to support and enhance category need or what sometimes we call primary demand. That's what the Got Milk campaign is all about, is to create primary demand for not a specific brand, but for a particular product type, which in this case is milk. Or the same is true for um, beef. It's what's for dinner. Right? All of those are um, campaigns that are designed to create category need. The light users know what your, um, they, know, they, know, they know your product already, and yet they're still only, they're still light users, so what would be the point then? Well, we don't know. We don't know the reason. Um, maybe it is a lack of uh, awareness. Um, maybe they don't know the, the features and benefits. Maybe the reason they don't drink orange juice is because they don't know that orange juice is high in calcium and vitamin A and D. So that's what we need to understand. In some cases, the light users, um, that's their situation. In other cases, they don't because maybe um, the orange juice is too acidic and it and it's, um, wreaks havoc on their stomach. So we, don't, we don't know what the reason is. Maybe it's right. too expensive. Who, I, you know? So in that case, advertising wouldn't, wouldn't really do anything. Only if, right home, if it's too expensive or if it's too safe, only if we change the product. Right, if we change the product. And we could use advertising to communicate to them that orange juice is high in calcium or orange juice is high in vitamin A and D. So get the light users to become moderate users or heavy users. 
So this is very insightful. Once you understand that there's some commonality amongst each of these individual segments, that they have similar needs and wants. But each case is going to be different. We need to understand why they're light juices. Why are they not purchasing milk or orange juice or <coughs> peanut butter? So you've spoken about both focusing on the heavy users and the light users, but what about the moderate users? Do you want to try to get them to buy more? Or? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> what we want to do is, for all of these, is increase the usage rate. That's our objective, is to increase the usage rate. So even if they're already heavy users, they buy milk twice a week, why can't we get, how do we get them to buy milk three times a week? How do we get them to buy milk four times a week? Or if they just don't need it. They may not, but, but we need to challenge ourselves to find out how do we increase usage, how do we increase consumption of our product or service. We don't want to spend the most money possible on the light user. I mean, that come up with a new slogan or something. Maybe well, it depends. Money. Like you're suggesting, it really depends on the reason why they're not purchasing. Like you suggested, well, if it's really that the juice is not in agreement with their stomach lining, then no matter how much we advertise, they're just not going to drink it. Like, who's going to drink that if it's going to, you know, give you pains in your stomach? But you need to understand. Now, in some cases, that might be maybe only 10% of the light users. Maybe the others, um, there's other issues, there's other reasons. Maybe the substitute product is less expensive. So why couldn't we have, if we are marketers of orange juice, why can't we have a good, better, best pricing strategy where we have a premium brand of orange juice and then we have um, a less expensive brand or an economy brand that light users will find affordable. So it, it's interesting, isn't it, to see that um, there is a different level of consumption by different customers. And importantly, the key takeaway is that after identifying this and understanding it is that as marketers, we can influence this. Certainly that's what we're going to try to do. Like you guys are pointing out is that, yes, they're light users. How do we get them to become moderate users? And the moderate users, what is it? We need to understand why they're moderate users and not heavy users. How do we increase their consumption and usage of our product? Wouldn't it be another category called non-users? Like yes. Well, yeah, light or non-users. Oh, yeah. Okay, like people who doesn't consent at all. Absolutely. So a non-user would definitely be one of the um, prospective buying groups. A absolutely. So these are actually, the way we're looking at it here as, <coughs> if we go up to this level, we're looking at users, which is what you're saying, and then the other group is non-users, which is a good point. So. Within users, we have light, moderate, and heavy. And then we have another segment, which is the non-users. Yeah, absolutely. And with the non-users also, we need to ask that question. Why? We really need to know why. And sometimes, very often, not just sometimes, you'll be surprised what consumers will tell you in research. Because it's not what we think or what we use, or what we like or don't like, it only matters what the customer thinks, what they like and what they would purchase or what they wouldn't purchase. You just said it only matters what the customer thinks. Um, I'm just wondering, do, they, do you ever try to change the customer's opinion, or do you, or do you would you rather tailor to what they want to hear? Well, once, they, once we know what their opinion is, then we could try to modify their behavior. But we need to understand what their perspective is, and some, in some cases, it's something that we're not able to change about our offering. And in other cases, um, we, we have a solution. We have something that will address their concern. That's not always the case. Maybe, um, maybe their concern is not, it's something that we could resolve. You have to check how much of an effect that this one, this group of non-users will to all have on your organization, like if you have 80, like if two 
100,000 people who don't use it and another 80,000 people who do use it, even as a, at a light, at a light uh, moderation, I guess, then uh, and it's not worth even touching their interest. Right, so the next step, once we segment the market, is we need to quantify the size of the marketing, of the market, that's what you're suggesting is, we need to do market sizing. So we need to know, is this 5%, 40%, and 55%? That's gonna impact our decision. Now, if life uses was 55%, then we might start to really think like, all right, well, 55% of my light uses, they use the product, but we just need to increase their usage rate. It might make sense. That's a very large segment that we would want to try and accelerate the rate of adoption of our product or service. But 5% their light users depends on the, how many people that actually is. 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but 5% of the population in China is pretty significant because there's 1 billion, 300 million people there. So 5% is what? 65 million people. Well, yeah, I wouldn't be so quick to turn a blind eye to 65 million people. Maybe we need to do some research and understand better their requirements. So another um, type of segmentation that I want to talk about is benefit, product benefit. And a good example when we talk about the benefit sort is if we look at toothpaste. So we have the toothpaste category. And there's different segments. Now what we're going to do is we're segmenting the market by benefit sort. So we're grouping together customers that want cavity protection, white teeth, fresh breath, plaque control, Tartar control. So this is a good example of how you could segment the market based on the benefit that's sought. Do you think this is insightful? So do you think so? In other words, take these given segments. Do they have similar needs and wants? David? No? You don't think so? This is what they've done. This is what Crest and Colgate um, has done is they segmented the market this way because they believe that the people who want um, a toothpaste that's going to whiten their teeth, right, that that's a similar need and want. And that segment is significant enough that they developed a specific product type that focuses on delivering that key benefit. Yeah. While others um, in their product line we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between a product line and a product mix and items in a product line. Others um, in their offering focus on delivering these other key benefits. Now maybe cavity prevention is something that transcends all of those benefits because even if it's not something that um, they're focusing on, you would like to think that isn't that really ultimately, that's sort of, I guess maybe the minimum requirement is that it will prevent cavities. But when you see the commercials, when you see the product on the shelf, they emphasize different benefits. Some of them they talk about in the packaging, and the packaging is the silent salesperson at the point of purchase. They focus on and include on the packaging the fact that this product will prevent cavities. Others promises fresh breath, whitening, etc. Yeah, just a question. Do you think that it's a, a bad strategy to try to say like 
we're going to go all in one. So, like, if Crest make a toothpaste and they say, well, this applies to people who, like, uh, you're at all in one, all five things. Target control of this, this, and all things that you lose from. Would you say it's a bad strategy because then you don't hit the crux of the market for each one of the things that you're targeting? Yeah, I know. They have that. They have, like, Colgate total. Yeah. And it's, it definitely is not in line with this model. I'm saying that's a bad strategy because then people who are looking for cavity protection want to see the big letters on the things that cavity protection. They want to see cavity protection, white fresh bed, all these things. They're just really looking for that one thing. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it does undermine what we're talking about. Is it bad? I mean, I think that um, you know a strategy could evolve, and maybe um, you know their research suggested that um, these individual segments have more in common amongst themselves than independently. So maybe ultimately they, um, after segmenting the market this way, that they ultimately said, you know what, maybe it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Maybe the, um, the customer now has come to expect all five of these benefits in one product. Because there is definitely um, groups of consumers who want multifunctionality in everything. Just like we have phones that you could send text messages, access the internet, um, take pictures, and yeah, I, I think it doesn't support um, this approach. Is it bad? It's hard to say without knowing the research. But I think that this is very compelling. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you kind of scratch your head and try to understand like why would they, why would they do that? Like you because they still sell ones that promise to do white it. teeth. Yeah freshening your breath and so forth. Now they have one that does it all. Well, maybe there is a segment. Maybe that's the other segment that we don't have here is the one that's the segment of consumers that want all. Well, like a little bit of everything. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that's their rationale. As they said, yeah, there's definitely a large segment, a large group of consumers who want this benefit, whitening and these others, and then there's some that want all of them. So we'd have to know, you know what size um, or what percentage of the category that re represents or in the size of each segment. So maybe this is 10%. I mean, this still might be 35%, but maybe this segment they feel is large enough that, yeah, there should be a product that is all-encompassing, that has multiple benefits. Even though I think this is definitely more compelling because, well, based on this category, what we know about the benefits that are sought. In other categories, it's less relevant. But certainly this example is very compelling. And all you need to do is just go into the store and look at the shelf for toothpaste. Then you could see um, where this uh, segmentation comes to life. When you uh, strip yourself out, maybe in this case a little too thin, and you think to be able to do everything, don't you run the risk of, uh, of, of saying that you actually do, do nothing, or losing the, the, uh, uh, the credibility of, of your customers? So we should limit the offering to, so like Henry Ford says, any Model T Ford you want, as long as it's black. Mm. So operationally, from, that's brilliant, but it ignores the needs and wants of the customers, which is that people don't just want Model T, or they don't just need Model T. They want Model A, B, C, and D, because let's say, for example, they have a large family. So they need a bigger car. And not everybody um, likes a particular color. Some people like black, <laughs> some people like blue, some people like green, some people want yellow cars, some people want orange cars. That's fine, but maybe, you know, by keeping them separate, you're claiming one thing and therefore the customer will be able to buy, buy into that and believe that. When you claim to do everything, then it's, it's difficult sometimes for the customer to, to, to take the product serious. Oh, so you're saying like this idea of like Colgate Total, you're saying, you're agreeing with him, like this is like really probably not such a good idea. Right. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. There might be a credibility, there might be an issue, people may not believe it, there may be some skepticism. Yeah, I could, absolutely. I could agree that. 
with that. I think you're right that there could be like if the product is too multifunctional and has too many promises, like it does this, 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 and this, and you're like, really? Like, yeah, I, sure. Yeah, I think that you raise a good point. Definitely, that that could be a problem. Uh, this product benefits implementation usually to the development of like new products. Like the benefit of like cavity or uh, plaque control, they make like plaque strips, for example. So is that frequent? Is that yeah, like absolutely. Um, one of the things that we try to um, to do in the research is, like we said, is to identify the unmet need and the needs and wants. And so, sure, this is something that we're going to look at in research, and that's what's going to fuel product development. So once we find this out in research, once we find out, they say, you know, if I was going to develop a toothpaste, um, I would develop one that um, could whiten teeth. That's, in, that's important to me. That would be an important benefit. <coughs> then it's up to the marketing team and the um, technicians and um, scientists to see, can we come up with a formulation that would actually whiten teeth? Can we come up with a formula that would actually reduce the level of um, tartar or plaque? So absolutely, we do that in research. We're trying to find out what are some products that um, we could produce that are going to meet those needs. Yeah, very good point. All right. Very important. If we need to, we could talk about this again. Um, and it'll come up again. Very important to understand segmentation and the significance of segmentation and the uh, criteria. And also, we talked about after we segment the market, importantly, what we're going to need to do is then quantify the size of the market. Could be a percentage, it could be in dollar terms, it could be in units, it could be um, in dollars, the number of people, to try and understand how large the segment is. Because we said that one of the criteria is that it's large, so first we're going to segment the markets, then we have to determine, well, how large are they? Is it 50% or is it 5%? Is it 1 billion people or is it 300 million people? Or is it 80 million people? Is it a market that sells $200 billion a year? Or is it $200 million a year? Do they sell 50 million units? Or do they sell 50,000 units of that particular item in a given uh, year, for example? That's called market sizing. So there's different ways that we could quantify the size of the market, but certainly it's important because we said, certainly we want the segment, generally, we want the segment to be large. So the question is, how large? So that's market sizing, and then once we size the market, then we have to select markets that we're going to penetrate. And we said, well, we're not going to, you know, it's logistically it's going to be very problematic to try and penetrate all the segments. So for example, if we're an apparel manufacturer, if we make clothes that we start this company and we decide that we're going to penetrate all segments. So we're going to, one segment would be jeans. So we're going to sell jeans and we're going to sell um, sweaters and we're going to sell t-shirts and we're going to sell polo shirts. How? Because like you said, in terms of new product development, how big is our team? I mean, how, you know, our designers, I mean, how could they possibly design all those different product types and be able to launch them simultaneously? It's going to be very challenging. It doesn't mean that we don't have a five-year, 10-year, 15-year plan where we're saying we're going to introduce genes first and then we're going to then develop other um, items, of, you know, other clothing or apparel. So size is something that we're going to consider, but then what were some of the other criteria that we said that we're, when we're selecting? Remember, so we're segmenting, quantifying, selecting, and positioning. 
So we divide the market into sub-markets. We quantify those markets, right? We determine the size. And then once we determine the size, then we're going to select. But besides size, what else did we say? We said the size of the market was important, but what else? When we're selecting. No, we always said that's the criteria in forming the segments, but in terms of selection. Selecting what? Selecting the particular segment that we're going to penetrate. So we have all those different segments, white teeth, tartar control, plaque. We're going to pick not all of them, we're going to pick some of them. Or if it's countries, we're not going to say, well, we're going to penetrate 100 countries. Well, we've got to decide. We're going to focus on Italy, France, Germany, just for example. But so how do we decide? One of the um, criteria we said was the size of the market. What else? Growth rate. Remember we said the growth rate of that particular market is an important criteria in selecting. <laughs> so how do we decide which to select? We're going to look at size. We're going to look at the growth rate. We're going to look at the overall market attractiveness of the particular segment. Those are things that we're going to use to decide which segments to select. How much is it going to cost to penetrate that particular segment? The level of concentration. Remember we talked about whether the market is highly concentrated or highly fragmented. And I share with you Porter's Five Forces model, which is a model we could use for determining market attractiveness, which includes the threat of new entrants, which means how likely is it that competition will enter the marketplace? In some cases, the barriers to entry are very high, and it's unlikely that when we enter the market, that other competitors would follow behind us. You see why that could be problematic, is if we enter the market and then 10 other competitors come behind us, then the market dynamic has changed very dramatically. And our ability to be profitable has also changed very dramatically. The threat of substitutes, that other products could substitute for hours. They provide the same functionality. Supplier power, buyer power, all of those are important and the level of rivalry amongst competitors. So all of those are things that we look at to determine the level of market attractiveness. That question Are, aren't like the criteria in selecting all like interconnected? Because like if you have like a, a high growth rate, then like then there's obviously a lot of like market attractiveness. Oh yeah, ultimately, what we when we're selecting a segment or multiple segments to penetrate, we're trying to evaluate market attractiveness. So all of those are components of market attractiveness. The size of the market, the growth rate, the level of rivalry, the threat of new entrants, the threat of substitutes, buyer power, supplier power, all of those things we look at, all of those metrics, we look at those to try and determine how attractive the market is. So is it better that we should launch our product in France or Germany or China or Israel or Iraq? That's what we're trying to decide. And then, ultimately, how are we going to position our product and brand in the marketplace? Remember I said positioning is the space that we occupy in the customer's mind. And we're going to talk about that um, down the road. And specifically, we're going to look at a perceptual map. And the perceptual map is a graphic visualization of our positioning, importantly, our positioning relative to our competitors. And you're going to do um, 
when you're doing this type of work, you're going to do 10 or 12 perceptual maps. That's generally what we do. And the reason we do that is because each perceptual map is going to look at different dimensions. So I'll just um, give you a preview of this. When we look at a perceptual map, how we're positioned relative to the competition. So here, we might have low price, high price, low quality, high quality. So is there a market for products that are of a low quality or a lesser quality? Yeah, absolutely. So we shouldn't shy away from that. And think about, importantly, where our brand is positioned relative to other competitors. So let's take cars, for example. Let's take cars. What, um, where would you say, where would you position Ford? Now you guys know how to read this, this, um, this map, right? So this is low price, high price, low quality, high quality. So where is Ford? Is Ford low price or high price or somewhere in between? In between. In between, so where? Here, here, there? First spot. Right here? Yeah. Okay, and what about quality? Are they up here? Um, yeah. Down? Down? Lower. Second. Down? Under the under the uh, Is it? Yeah, <laughs> <somewhere. laughs> somewhere over here. So that's what we'll put Ford here. Much lower. Now importantly, mm -hmm. the fact that you guys don't agree is um, is important because that's what we want to understand to our research is what is your perception of our brand? relative to our competitors. Everybody's not going to agree, then we could synthesize all that information and determine how the target market or a certain group of customers perceive our brand as being positioned in the market and what's so helpful is relative to the competitors because the next thing we want to look at is let's say Mercedes. So where is Mercedes in terms of price? Highest and highest. Highest and highest. Oh, no. Highest. 75% of them. Yeah, that's yeah. right. All right. There's Lamborghini. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about um, Toyota? I think right above. Uh, I think that's about four. Um, no. Price quality lower, 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 so do you start to see how this is helpful? So not just where we're positioned, but it's important to know that we occupy here and our competitors are here and we want to know who's in our competitive set. So who are our number direct and indirect competitors? This is going to tell us what? Toyota, Honda, right? That these are in the same competitive set, we could argue that they're direct competitors um, and that Mercedes is an indirect competitor since Mercedes also provides luxury. Luxury and a means of transportation. So they're competing each against each other but in different segments, different price points. I put Jaguar with uh, Benz also. Yeah, we could put Jaguar there. Yeah, BMW. Yeah. So now strategically, if we're going to do like you said, Moshe, right? If we're going to um, develop new products, we have to decide where we're going to pos be positioned. Now maybe we want to go here. Maybe we're going to decide we're going to try and position ourselves here, or maybe here. But then maybe over here we say, you know what? That means that we're going to be competing against Jaguar, Mercedes, Benz, and BMW. Maybe we can't get there from here, so to speak. Right? Maybe that's not attractive, that competitive set. So we need to decide where we're going to be positioned. All right, so we have a few minutes left. Let's talk about, I want to start um, our discussion about <coughs> products. Questions? Are we good? Yes. Are we great? Yes. All right. Rock. Yeah. All right. Let's keep rolling. We've got a couple of minutes. 
Let's see what we could cover here. <laughs> All right, there's different types of products. And in this category, and you'll see this um, in chapter 10, when we talk, product is a general term. We use that term very loosely. There's goods and services. So when we use the term product, and I know I realize that this might be a little bit different from the way that you're used to using the term, but um, in marketing, we use the term product, and that's why I always try to make a distinction. I always try to catch myself from using the word consumer, right? I always try to say customer, because customers are more of a general term as opposed to saying consumer, because consumer implies... You're buying something. Yeah, I mean, also, but I mean, it implies us, us as shoppers. And what I'm trying to suggest is there doesn't need to be us as shoppers, but it could be business to business, right? So <laughs> product is a general term, refers to goods and services. And when we talk about different types of goods, we have durable and non-durable. I'm sorry, I know that um, from marketers you would expect something more creative, but that's the, <laughs> the terminology. Durable and non-durable, and often the word non-durable is replaced with the word consumable. So those words are uh, used interchangeable. All right, so what's the difference between durable and non-durable? Who could tell us? Durability. Well, let's keep going. Whether, <laughs> whether it stands up in the market type of thing, where, where like, how long, is, like how long, yeah, how long will it last in the market? Like, is it, is it going to fail after one season, or is it going to go on? Also, the product itself. How many times are you going to have to use it over and over again? Are you going to have to buy it more? Yes, you're Continue. right. Exactly. Tell us. Say it louder. That's right. Like if it's if, if it's one or the other, so um, if you're going to have people buying it constantly, like you have to renew your purchase. Leather jacket, um, synthetic jacket. Like leather jacket will last a long time, whereas if you get a poncho, the plastic poncho, you have to keep getting new ones, and they're not the same thing. <laughs> but right. So a durable product, a durable good, is one that's reusable. And we could use it many times. It doesn't mean that it has an infinite life, but we could use it again and again. Like, um, like you're saying, a leather jacket, we could use it again and again. But non-durable, or which very often referred to as like consumable, is that it has a limited number of uses, right? Like juice, right? Like orange juice. Like you buy a, a half a gallon of orange juice, it's consumable. You're able to get 10 glasses out of it, and then that's it. So orange juice, toothpaste, milk, all of those are considered to be consumable products. Yes, go ahead. Um, would, would like, let's say like Beats with like a warranty, like headphones with a warranty, would it be? Beats? Like uh, headphones. headphones. Oh, 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 oh. Headphones I'm thinking Beats, like Beats, like, yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah. Headphones with a warranty, like, would that be considered, um, Durable just because like if they break, like you can always just get the new one. The new one is just like you can go on forever. Yeah, well, like the, well, it's it's yeah, well, by the fact that it's um, that you could use it again, that it's not consumed, that you could use the product and it doesn't get used up. It could wear out. Sure, any um, durable product could wear out. Your leather jacket could wear out. Your car could wear out. But um, in terms of the definition of durable, means that it's. Um, there's numerous uses, right? That you could use it multiple times. Disposable camera versus digital camera. Right, like disposable. It's a good example, right? So if you want to say um, that it's um, disposable, you might say that's synonymous with consumable. So it's important for us to understand that because that's going to change our marketing plan. If our product is durable versus consumable. So consumable means, like we said, people are going to buy our product every week. That's very different from saying people are going to buy our product every decade. Right? So how often do people buy a car, for example? That's very different from saying somebody's in the store every week and they're buying Tropicana. 
versus I buy a car every 10 years. You see how that's going to really shape and define our marketing plan. And there are some things that are sort of, you know, in between, like maybe yeah. a computer. Like, you know, five years you plan to have a computer, six years. So that's not really consumable, but that's not, you know, also durable. durable. Durable is like sort of permanent, no? Um, well, when we say, um, yeah, you could, you could make that distinction if you want to make a distinction between um, a product like a car versus a computer. Right, I think what you're saying, you think you're trying to get at the lifespan of the product, which is that some cases it could be 20 years, right? Even cars with high mileage, right, and have problems, they still could be around for 20 years, right, 25 years. But um, not so much the case with laptops. It, usually they just sort of stop working, and that's like sort of beyond our control, no matter how many times you change the oil or rotate the tires or whatever. Right, that it just has this like built-in obsolescence. So yeah, that's fine that we make that distinction, that there's different levels of durability. That's certainly helpful to us to earn, understand that, um, you know, that because a product is durable doesn't necessarily mean that it's rugged. You see the difference there? That it's durable means that we could use it multiple times. We could use it over and over again, but it doesn't mean if you drop it that it won't break. So... We need to get comfortable with the with the with the terminology and the and the implications. But I think what you were getting at is that right? Like you're thinking about well, yeah, the car there's versus a big, there's a big gray area, sort of. Yeah. So I think we should make that distinction between the durability of a product versus whether or not a product is considered to be durable versus consumable. That's right. Questions. I mean, that's also why Apple always constantly updates their services and their products. Because if they, the iPod was the same iPod 10 years ago as it is today, then no one would buy it again. And that, like, that's what makes people interested in their product, that it, it has a different feature to it. That's what drags people in also.